But in general, I think the uh, mobility sector has changed a lot in the last two years. It may have not been recognized by everyone, uh, but a lot of companies work like or use the time that they have now to work on their products and, and do a lot of things. And we see that also in cities, that they use the um, pause that they had or the, the less traffic that they have during the pandemic to change a lot of things. We see that in Paris, we see that also here in my hometown in Berlin. Uh, Paris has adopted a low emission zone and so uh, vehicle, uh, diesel vehicles are evicted and uh, buses uh, are part of these uh, uh, diesel vehicle. So there is a program uh, to, uh, um, to turn these uh, uh, diesel buses into clean buses. It's quite simple. If you want more reliable buses, you need better systems, more services and more drivers. By well, the time we get to 2030, the big trends will be obviously everything electric, um, you will see a huge diversity of vehicles, a whole lot of new brands you've never heard before. The Chinese have about 30 um, fairly serious electric car companies and they're starting to launch into Europe this year and next year. So we'll see brands we've never heard of before coming out of um, Southeast Asia. Um, there's a very good brand, for example, coming out of Vietnam. So a, a whole lot of new players in, in, in the industry. I would uh, like to say that uh, we will have uh, Olympic Games in uh, 2024 and it will be a good test because there are a lot of projects of uh, new transport offers. Uh, of course, uh, autonomous uh, uh, shuttles, um, uh, robot taxis and so and so. Uh, but there will be also uh, needed a lot of uh, special uh, bus routes uh, in order to um, transport the, the, the Olympic delegations. The question is what would be the confidence level in the public opinion and where are we now with that? Would you let your children go to school holidays without any driver behind the steering wheel? Um, and, and that's why I think there is a big effort to make on, you know, public acceptance about these technologies, which are um, eventually safer. And that's why we need to become more and more transparent on the data performance of autonomous vehicle. Bonjour à tous. Merci à tous les participants d'être présents aujourd'hui. A warm welcome to all participants to our Bus to Bus Roadshow. My name is Pascal Canova Menke. I'm the founder and the managing director of Promo Intex. represents in France international trade show organizers that are actually spread all over the world in Europe, in the US, and in the Emirates. Nevertheless, as Germany is the first export partner of France, we have a great focus on Germany and uh, most of our activity is the representation of Messe Berlin and particularly Bus to Bus Berlin, that's the, the subject that matters today. But I won't be nothing alone and nobody actually is. Lea Marroc, Sales Director of Promo Intex, is working with me. Together we assist, advise, support about 4,500 French companies a year in their export strategy and participation at trade shows. Our activity consists of promoting the international shows in France to a target of exhibitors that are producers and potential visitors that are buyers. We are also in close contact with uh, multipliers and the press party to achieve this goal. As for France now, um, it's well known for luxury products like perfumes, uh, cosmetics or fashion, for its wine and gastronomy or its beautiful cultural um, towns or landscape as well. But France cannot be resumed to the Tour Eiffel or French baguettes. Uh, we have much more to offer and we are proud of our French market, which is extremely dynamic in sectors like agriculture, industry, energy, mobility, transportation, railway, research and finance. The French system is producing innovation, vision, 
value. A way of processing has sometimes been revolutionary, but what counts now is results. And, and in the fields of mobility and the environmental awareness, it's high time that we get results. At that point, let me pass over to Leah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pascal. Indeed, France is the fifth stop of our virtual journey for Europe, and we are happy to welcome our guests to this French stop to the digital roadshow. We are here to talk about the bus industry and to discuss the transformation to sustainable passenger transport in the Paris region. Therefore, we are welcoming four experts to be our panelists today, and I already want to thank them for accepting our, vi our invitation. And also to thank our media partners for their collaboration. Let me give you a few facts about the transport sector in France. Because of the French geographical configurations, the history of its organization and its territorial organization, France has a particularly long road network and its density is high compared to the neighbor countries. In addition, the French rail network is the second longest in Europe and the urban public transport represents today more than 45 billion passengers. Transport remains a sector with the greatest level of emissions uh, in France, accounting for 31% of the national emissions. So it is therefore time to make some changes and to make the transport sector greener in France. To make the session more interactive, you, as our participants, have the possibility to ask questions on the chat and later on, our panelists will have time to answer them. Before I hand over to my colleague, Willow beck Jewett, sorry, from the German Bus to Bus team, who will tell us more about the trade show and what we can expect next in April in Berlin, I would like to welcome our participants from France and abroad, you. Now, I usual an enlightening session, and I'm sure you get some valuable insight about the future of transportation. Thank you, and Willow, the floor is yours. Thanks, Leah, and uh, also a warm, warm welcome from my side to all of our viewers and our participants today. Um, we are, uh, this is our fifth roadshow and uh, the last before we have our on-site event uh, in April 2022 this year. And I'd like to just take a moment uh, to say a few words about Bus to Bus. We are still quite a new event. We happened the first time in 2017, again 2019, and we're supposed to take place in 2021, but due to the pandemic, as you can see, we've shifted one year um, to 2022. And uh, in 2021, we had an online uh, event called the Bus to Bus Special Edition. And this was something that really underlined um, our goals for this year. And um, that is that we really want to put focus on the innovation and, and help shape the image of the bus. And, we can see from that event and from the past years that the bus perhaps is a little bit underrated or undervalued as a mode of transport um, in comparison to other modes of transport. And we really want to, um, to support this. And uh, I'd just like to say maybe a few things as well about if you are going to join us uh, next year or this year uh, on site in Berlin, what you can expect. So if you have a... Um, ticket for the bus to bus, um, you are granted access to all three components. So we have our trade show, which is the, um, the, the stands within the trade show halls, our outdoor exhibit where you have live um, presentations as well as the opportunity to test drive some vehicles and our startup area. We, it'll also grant you access to our full stage program. So that's divided into two tracks. Uh, the Future Forum and the BDO Congress, which is uh, together with our long-standing partner, the German Association of Bus and Co Coach Operators uh, here in Berlin. And this year we're really going to focus on topics like uh, sustainability, alternative drives, intelligent vehicles, uh, political issues and fresh travel. And um, the tracks will either take place in German or English with corresponding um, translation for our international guests. And last but not least, our um, last element of Bus to Bus uh, is Bus to Specials. So that's also for you uh, within the trade show halls. We have interactive workshops, we have a startup competition, and we have uh, presentations on stage from our exhibitors who will talk about their innovations and their products that they've brought with them this year. 
Um, that being said, I, I uh, really want to say from, I think on behalf of all of my team that uh, we, we really want to welcome you in Berlin and we're really looking forward to having an on-site event. And um, even with the pandemic going on and the rising numbers, we are still very positive that we're going to take place at the end of April. And we really look forward to uh, seeing everybody there. As Leah mentioned, please do not hesitate to put your questions uh, into the box below the live stream, either about bus to bus or about the topics we'll talk today at the roadshow. And we look forward to answering those questions today um, during the discussions or at the end in our Q&A. Um, that being said, I think we should get our roadshow started. I'd like to uh, introduce our senior product manager, Kerstin kube Atkins, and uh, hand over the digital microphone and uh, say as well to all of our participants, have fun today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Willow, and uh, a warm welcome from my side to, to all our viewers and participants. The Best of Us Special Edition, which took place in April, as Willa just said, brought together around 900 experts from Germany and abroad. And there was one thing which was impressive, uh, impressively underlined here. The bus industry is innovative and indispensable in the climate-friendly mobility mix of the future. Buses and coaches are available in almost all sizes, increasingly equipped with climate-friendly drives. And this makes, from our point of view, this means of transport for distant, for tailor-made mobility concepts in cities and rural regions. Together with an increased demand of safety on board, digital services, cool design and equipment, the bus is or should be the star amongst the means of transport. Or to say it in bus-to-bus -bus language, the bus is able to provide innovative and sustainable ex travel experience, and we call this uh, fresh travel. So welcome to France, welcome to Paris, and welcome to our moderator, Don Dahlmann. Don Dahlmann is a successful journalist, author and consultant in the fields of future mobility, autonomous driving, smart cities, IoT and AI. For the online magazine Gundersen, he has established a new vertical called Automotive and Mobility. Uh, as a writer, he works for various publications, including World am Sonntag, Mobile Geeks, Together with his colleague, Nicole Scott, he made a documentary actually this year, uh, The Future of Hydrogen and Mobility, and he won several international awards with it. So, Don, welcome. Great to have you on board of this uh, mobility uh, digital uh, roadshow here today. Don, um, how have you been, if you have been observing the mobility sector for a long time. How have you been experiencing the almost two years of the pandemic and has this changed your mobility behavior? Hello and good morning. And uh, thank you for having me here uh, at the Digital Roadshow from Paris. Yes, uh, it has changed. I'm sitting more at home, actually. You know, as part of my work and as a journalist, I travel a lot normally. But uh, since two years, I'm more and more stuck at home. And um, with my cats, obviously, and um, uh, yeah, but this is um, this is this is just my view. Oh, this is just my personal view on mobility at the moment from my from my place here. But in general, I think uh, mobility sector has changed a lot in the last two years. It may have not been recognized by everyone, uh, but a lot of companies work like or use the time that they have now to work on their products and, and do a lot of things. And we see that also in cities, that they use the uh, pause that they had or the, the less traffic that they have during the pandemic to change a lot of things. We see that in Paris. We see that also here in my hometown in Berlin, uh, where we have more bike roads, where we have more public transport now. And there is a general shift away from the car to public transport. Oh, so... Welcome again, Don. And uh, yes, we will uh, uh, um, talk about uh, much more about uh, the future of mobility right now. And I'd like to uh, give you the digital floor. And uh, I'm really looking forward to meet our discussion panelists today. Yeah, thank you very much, Kerstin. And uh, also another welcome from my side. I hope you're go going to enjoy the coming minutes of uh, panel discussions and interesting information we get uh, what's going on in Paris in terms of mobility and Paris has been kind of in focus uh, for the changes in the mobility sector for quite a while now thanks 
to the changes that they are doing in terms of changing the infrastructure, changing the way people are moving to Paris. Uh, I've been to Paris a couple of times and uh, I've been there with a car, with train and even with plane. Uh, but when I was there with a the car, I uh, always had this totally chaotic uh, traffic that you have to manage in Paris, of course, especially uh, when you go into the inner parts of the city. Uh, but this has changed in the last couple of years. Paris has uh, changed its way of um, seeing mobility and trying to get rid of cars, especially individual cars, personal cars, uh, for like short, um, short travel distances. And the public transport is, has become more of a focus. And that's uh, going to be very interesting to hear about today, uh, how they did it and, and what are the outlooks in the future for Paris. I mean, they will start out phase diesel powered cars by 2024. That is in two years. So you will not allow it with your diesel powered car to go into the city of Paris. And for fossil fuel cars in general, uh, this will end by 2030, so uh, you have six or eight more years to change to an electric powered cars. We have a lot of questions, of course, what's happening in Paris and and uh, what what's going on there. And we'll just give you um, also an outlook for uh, the public transport uh, sector because buses are, of course, heavily involved in that. Um, and can, for example, public transport with buses close the gap? Can they really? Um, how can I frame it? Can they really be the um, the mean of uh, the, the solution for the means of transportation for most of people, or do the do we need like other um, uh, solutions for that? Do we need like small autonomous vehicles or buses that are driving around, or do we need the larger ones? And how do you include the the public, the inhabitants of the Parisians, uh, in in these concepts? Can can you just like propose something or can you make them be part of it and how do are they expecting or accepting these uh, these um, new things and these new forms of mobilities that they are facing at the moment. These are um, a lot of things that we can talk about today, especially about concepts and about what is going on in the future. And I'm very happy that I'm not alone here because we have um, a four very good informed panelists that are, will help us identifying what's going on in Paris. And I want to start with uh, my introductions uh, with Sandrine Garnier. She is uh, a journalist specialized in transport and mobility for more than 20 years. And Mobilicites is a website uh, that she founded and that is dedicated to the field of transportation and uh, the mobility. Uh, it runs a public uh, newsletter, of course, that you can follow. And uh, it has also a print and web magazine or a print magazine, which is rare nowadays. And I'm happy to have you here, Sandrine. Um, you're covering the changes in the mobility sector in France and Paris now for a long time. And um, Paris is, as I said, is a kind of front runner when it comes to changes into the mobility sector and the new things that are happening. They're a kind of role model also for other cities. I know that Berlin is looking very closely to what's happening in Paris. Um, can you explain for our international viewers that may be not familiar with the whole situation in Paris, what happened in Paris in the last year and what made them fall out of love with their cars? <laughs> Yes, yes, with pleasure. Uh, first, uh, I, I would like to remind us some figures and some facts about the uh, governance framework here in Paris, because the city of Paris uh, doesn't uh, manage uh, the transport, uh, the public transportation uh, alone. It's um, uh, it dedicated to the large uh, region, uh, Ile-de-France, uh, you have to know that Paris is 2.2 million inhabitants and the region Ile-de-France is uh, 12 million inhabitants. So, uh, and you, you have to know that France is a very centralized country and this is the same uh, for Paris. Paris is really a huge city in France. And uh, for example, the, the total of... Uh, local trains, uh, tra tra travels by local trains 
in Ile-de-France is half of the total of local trains in all the French country. So uh, Ile-de-France is really a big, big uh, part of the total of uh, public transportation in France. Uh, before COVID, before the pandemic, there was uh, 25 million travel each day in the region de France. Uh, among these, uh, 9.4 million in public transport, 14.6 million by car. So car stays the, the, the majority of travels, uh, even if uh, public transportation is uh, um, increasing, is uh, providing more and more offer, car stays the, the first choice. And um, among this, there was uh, 5 million travels by bus. Okay, so uh, another thing uh, about the transport uh, in Paris area is that uh, the offer is very, very efficient in the heart of the city, but uh, it's not so good around in the suburbs. If you live in the suburbs, uh, it's very, very difficult especially with transport, uh, with uh, public transportation to get uh, in other suburbs. If you want to get in Paris, generally speaking, it's easy, can be long, but it's easy. But from suburb to another point in the suburb, it will be very, very uh, long because uh, most of the time you have to go uh, first in the center of Paris and change to get another line. So uh, one of the most uh, projects is to uh, improve this uh, offer from in inner suburbs. And uh, there is a big project, a uh, railway project, which is uh, called the Grand Paris Express, uh, with uh, 200 kilometers of lines, uh, which is uh, uh, in progress nowadays. And uh, this costs 36 billion of uh, euro. And it will be achieved uh, between uh, uh, 2026 and 2036. So um, this is uh, a, a lot of, and, and you you said that a lot of changes are, are in in work uh, are, are on on their way uh, in Paris, and uh, among this the the city the the city itself wants to. Um, to get rid of the personal cars, but it is not so easy to, to make because of what I just said, it's still difficult and it's, uh, it's more and more difficult for people who live uh, outside the inner city, the center of the city, to get uh, where they want to, to go to, for work, for leisure, so, or some, something else. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, coming to our next uh, guest that we have on our panel today, this is uh, Ross Douglas, and Ross um, is or was was or is still a filmmaker for National uh, Geographic. So he's traveled a lot, especially um, to Africa and the Okavango Delta, where he filmed a lot. And he learned, of course, in his travel um, by doing these documentaries about nature that global warming is an issue that we have to tackle um, and that is nothing that we can wait for. Um, so we have to start now. And he wanted to play a role in reducing emissions. Uh, and uh, so he decided to move to Paris where he started Autonomy Paris. This is a trade show focused on alternatives to car ownership. So uh, something that you can look at and think, okay, I don't need my car. I can use other means of a transportation. Autonomy produces an annual trade show, weekly newsletters, and summits, of course, in uh, other cities than Paris, for example, in Berlin and in London. Um, Ross, um, your trade show is specialized in showing alternative modes of transportation, so anything else than a car. Um, and cars seem to be kind of becoming obsolete or they're on a way of becoming obsolete in certain cities, including Paris. But what can other cities learn from Paris? Because as we just heard from also from Sandrine, 
uh, even with cars being still dominant in, in means of transportation, there is a change in perspective when it comes to cars. Ross? I think I think cars are not becoming obsolete, but um, the car ownership is changing. So you know, the, the the environmental problem is just that car ownership is incredibly environmentally expensive, um, even if you're having an electric car. Uh, Volvo did a, a comparative analysis of their XC40, which is a combustion car, and their uh, electric equivalent. Um, and even if you're running it on 100% renewable energy, um, it's only sort of roughly half the carbon footprint of a of a combustion car. So I, you know, I think what's what's happening is that car ownership no longer makes sense in cities. And this is because of three reasons. One is that cities like Paris are, are making it more difficult to have car ownership. They're putting in, for example, cycling infrastructure. The city of Paris spent 150 million euros, mainly on cycle lanes, and they took those away from car lanes. So it's more and more difficult to, to own and use a motor car in cities like Paris. London's going in the same direction. Um, the, the second thing is that um, people are realizing that car ownership has a massive environmental footprint, uh, whether it's combustion or electric. And then the third point is that there's just a lot of alternatives to car ownership that um, there were not before. So our trade show, Autonomy Paris, focuses on alternatives to car ownership, including car sharing. So I think cars are not the problem. Car ownership is a problem. And the reason why it's a problem is that just the construction of motor cars has a massive, massive environmental footprint. And then most cars are used sort of only 90, only sort of three, four percent of their life. So that other time period, they are spent basically parked on streets that are very valuable real estate and cities want to reclaim those streets um, in order to repurpose them for you know gardens for bicycle lanes um, for parking for bicycles etc cetera, etc cetera. so what what we're seeing is that all cities are not coming up with ways of reducing car ownership radically um, Berlin for example has a plan to make a, a, an area the size of Manhattan apparently car free um, the city of London has just announced that by 2028, they want 80% of journeys in the city to be either walking, cycling, public transport. Um, and what you'll see is you'll see a, a continual reduction in car ownership. And we call that the move from motorist to mobilist. So I think the two big trends going on, one is obviously the, 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 the move to electric vehicles. And then the other is a move away from car ownership to all other forms of mobility, which is obviously good news for the bus industry too. Thank you, Ross. Um, our next guest is uh, Pierre Maillot. Uh, he's acting vice president of business development for Hex Technologies. And uh, Hex Technologies provides data and data management platform efficiently extracting and uh, delivering valuable data sets of engineering teams working on highly autonomous systems. And of course, we're talking about self-driving cars. Pierre was previously working for Bosch for 15 years. And of course, he's an expert in terms of autonomous cars and the workflows behind it, uh, especially the whole back end of, of it. I mean, you have the car, of course, with all the sensors and the software, but you also have like a back end from the car that has uh, to be managed also. Uh, autonomous cars are kind of hot topic since a couple of years, like it's two or three years, and we're coming, or we like inching closer to having autonomous cars. Um, Self-driving cars are a huge bet, Pierre, and, um, but are we ever going to see like fully autonomous cars in cities like Paris with all its traffic? And how are they fitting into the idea of a, mostless, uh, of a mostly uh, a carless city? Yes, thanks, uh, Dan, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, so it's a, it's a great question that uh, I get uh, often asked. Um, the thing is that since uh, the emergence of the first uh, autonomous driving experiments in, in 2005, uh, the industry predicted a large uh, deployment of autonomous vehicles by 2020. Obviously, this is not happening. And it's not happening because there are a lot of barriers to you know, deployment and implementation. Some of them are legal. Some of them are linked to the public adoption of these technologies, but mostly it's uh, linked to the technology itself. Um, when you develop an autonomous driving uh, vehicle, uh, you need a very robust and powerful AI that needs to reach a very high accuracy, right? So 
Um, if your smartphone is not detecting a face, it doesn't have the same consequences as a car not detecting a pedestrian. So intelligence needs data, a lot of data. The more intelligent your car becomes, the more data you are generating and the more useless data is also being generated because this is data that is not being used by the intelligence to continue the training. Therefore, extracting the meaningful data set becomes very difficult and there is a lot of time and resources that are being wasted to extract the relevant data set for all the engineering activities such as object annotation, machine learning training, debugging of software, system validation and so on. Therefore, it takes much more time than planned. Some companies are dying the market is becoming more and more consolidated with merging and acquisition. But with 200 billions of dollars invested over the last 10 years, there is an urgent need to accelerate the time to market for these industry stakeholders. That's why we created our company X Technologies. We are actually offering software services and a data management platform to help our customers focusing on the meaningful situations via an event-based approach in order to automate, accelerate the extraction and the distribution of relevant data within their organization. We actually transform big data into smart data, which will result in tremendous efficiencies and cost reductions during the whole product lifecycle from development to the business operation phase. Now that that has been said, back to your question. Paris. I've lived in San Francisco for five years, from 2016 to 2020. And in 2016, I was already able to see a lot of test vehicles on the road, with obviously driver behind the wheel, but these were actual autonomous driving vehicles from Waymo, from Cruise, from Zooks. Now these vehicles are getting into operation with a permit in San Francisco, right? So as a, as a, as a San Francisco resident, I can actually now use this car uh, if I'm being selected by these companies. But San Francisco streets are straightforward. Uh, you know, it's not the same urban design as Paris. There is a higher public acceptance. It's also close to all most of these companies location, you know, in the Silicon Valley. And the thing is that you cannot, it's like it's like learning a language. You cannot take a car that was trained to drive in San Francisco and then put it in Charles de Gaulle Etoile and, you know, expect that car to be driving around uh, the Ad Triumph. And that, in my opinion, is a huge, you know, hurdle for autonomous driving vehicle to be deployed tomorrow in Paris. It's still going to be taking a lot of time, also with public adoption. Therefore, I don't see, you know, autonomous vehicle being largely deployed in Paris yet because I don't see a lot of test, you know, car in Paris streets. Uh, what I see, and, and uh, it's that autonomous vehicle technology will be part of a multimodal ecosystem uh, with a few autonomous driving applications here and there where it's possible. For example, like shuttles that are, will operate as a first last mile route. Thank you, um, uh, Pierre, of course. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to be developed. Um, our um, last but not least uh, guest on the panel is Suprian Moreau. Uh, he's working with uh, Hupop and they created a solution uh, for uh, buses and coach drivers within the day uh, and they help streamline operations on large scale, especially for fleet management and the digital projects that you have when you have uh, a huge fleet. This is something that is going on at the moment, also like in the background, of course, fleets needs, need to change also with everything we talked about so far today. And a Cyprian a company is helping them uh, in this regard. And buses are really the backbone of public transport around the world, no matter where you're looking or which country you're looking at. And they will become even more important for the future of mobility, because as we heard, uh, if you reduce the number of cars in cities, you of course need other means of transportation, buses included. So, uh, Suprian, what can and what need public transport provider to do 
to make the bus transport better. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. <coughs> um, if I need to answer this question about what we need to do to make uh, what we uh, as a public transport provider, operator and agencies to do to make bus better, I think we need to profoundly change the image we have of bus uh, and bus tra transportation. In France, in Paris, most of the time people doesn't take the bus by choice. They, they take it because they have to and they prefer to use other means of transportation uh, like uh, subway, um, uh, suburb trains and so on. Why? It's because uh, it's not as uh, efficient or as reliable as or it seems less efficient on less reliable as it can uh, as um, uh, indifference of what a subway or a sub, uh, suburban train can. And uh, it, it poses problems because uh, because it is it is seen as uh, not as efficient. Um, people doesn't work, uh, want to be in it and doesn't want to work in it. And it causes much pro more problems on um, adaptation on uh, what operators can do to do better. Uh, for example, uh, it has been years now that uh, bus operator as uh, as having are having issues to recruit new drivers, and now that the pandemic is here, uh, it has been harder and harder to find more drivers, and it's even harder uh, because you have the reason of a public private partnership elections, and uh, you need to always find new drivers and adapt your plans to transfer competences, uh, transfer experience, transfer um, uh, systems to another company. Uh, and it's it has been very hard for people to uh, keep track of uh, what they have been doing and uh, find time to um, have more efficient and more reliable services. And I think when we when we think of uh, having better bus uh, services, better system, we uh, we need not to forget that uh, there are people operating uh, behind uh, behind everything, behind your bus, behind your new technologies, uh, behind uh, your new uh, decarbonated uh, vehicle or autonomous car. Uh, you still need operators. You need people to operate this. And if you are only working on having the better price or the better uh, operation uh, or better um, technologies, you're forgetting about the people and you can't have uh, services which will be uh, better and better if you forget the people behind and pay, the, pay them uh, as much as they need or to keep the driver, to keep their workforce and uh, concentrate on doing better service. Thank you, Supreme, for this uh, interesting answer. Yeah, I totally agree. There is uh, the whole shift and the whole shift also like in about how we think about um, these kind of uh, topics that you just talked about. Um, it's, it just started. And as we uh, talked about like uh, now for the first round of questions about the, the situation in Paris, I think one of the most interesting things, um, Sandrine, um, is that public transport um, plays a bigger role now in, in yes. Paris than it used to be. Um, but how did they change or how did the public transport system change in the last years? What did they do better and what kind of role place the bus nowadays in the everyday commute while you're not using your car? Uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, it uh, uh, before, Don, uh, Paris has adopted a low emission zone and so uh, vehicle, uh, diesel vehicles are evicted and uh, buses uh, are part of these uh, uh, diesel vehicles. So there is a program uh, to, uh, um, to turn these uh, uh, diesel buses into clean buses. 
And uh, nowadays, uh, RATP, which is uh, the, um, the, the the society in charge of running uh, um, buses, but also as a tube in Paris, is changing all of the fleet of the uh, uh, 4,700 buses. Uh, it's also a huge uh, quantity uh, to clean buses. And that will be, uh, all the buses will be cleaned uh, by 2025. Um, um, that's uh, a, a great uh, change also for people in Paris because clean buses, they are uh, more comfortable, they are less noisy than uh, uh, all the diesel buses. And the people also, beside this, uh, clean aspect, uh, they are expecting uh, less uh, empty buses uh, running in the city because uh, this is this image of uh, empty buses driving uh, uh, is not so good. People are thinking that uh, they are uh, running with their money and what uh, what uh, what for. So uh, the. PTA is uh, thinking of um, uh, running smaller vehicles uh, and also um, autonomous vehicles in some areas uh, in order to reduce this uh, image of uh, useless big vehicles empty uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the, the center of the afternoon, for example. And uh, eventually, as I said before, there is also a great potential for buses outside the heart of Paris because people need uh, offers to, uh, to, to go from a suburb to another one. And there, uh, there are places where uh, it's uh, um, efficient to uh, build and to... to, to, to to uh, sorry, uh, uh, to uh, run a BRT, for example, which is a, a special lane for uh, buses uh, which are very, very, uh, um, uh, which run uh, very often, uh, like uh, a metro, for example. So buses is a part, uh, plays a, uh, a big part in the the the, the change of the the offer. Of the public transportation offer. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, that's that's quite interesting. I didn't know that every um, bus in Paris should be electric by 2025. That's, that's uh, uh, yes. Not not uh, not hundred percent electric, but okay. it will be uh, six, uh, uh, sixty sixty uh, percent clean gas and forty percent electric. Oh well, but well, still forty percent is a lot. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. there's a lot of buses going around in uh, in Paris, which brings me also to the next questions to Ross. Um, you are an expert in terms of like what are people asking for and when they want to get rid of their car. Um, I, I mean, I'm maybe also a good example here in Berlin because I got rid of my car like eight years ago or nine years ago, I think now. And I'm using like different modes of transportation with a focus on car sharing for me, for example, at the moment in Berlin. Um, but what, if you look at in Paris um, and in France, what has become the center of attention in terms of alternative transportation? Is this a car sharing or is there other uh, modes that are very interesting? You're muted, Ross. So there's lots of data, you know, you can get from Move It and, and, and Fluctua and, and Via Nova that show the data of the different modes of mobility. Um, and as you were saying, generally when people stop car ownership, they become multimodal. So they, you know, they look at a, a number of different ways of moving. But the, the single biggest trend in all European cities has actually been an, an increase in electric bikes. Um, that's been the sing, single biggest trend in the last three, four years. And, you know, what we see generally over a long period of time is that people are, are generally don't like using public transit. In America, um, public transit in, in the 70s, 10% of workers would take public transport. Now it's only 5%. Um, so people generally like individual transport. And what we're seeing in European cities is that there's been this huge increase in bicycle sales, particularly electric bike sales, because 
e-bikes are very efficient for moving people, um, you know, further than a, than a normal bike. Um, in Paris, you know, what you see is, is a combination of increase in bike ownership, increase in bike share, increase in scooter share. You know, you, we have three operators, Birdline, Boy, um, who do very well because Paris has, has a lot of scooter use. Um, but in terms of the public transit share, the move it data shows that obviously public transit went really down um, when the pandemic hit, and it's now back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, you'll see as people becoming more and more multimodal, where they'll be using their smartphones to make a decision whether they're going to use bike share, scooter share, their own bike, um, you know, public transit. And I imagine once you start getting the autonomous shuttles from Navia and Easy Mile coming. Um, doing fixed routes that will really make a huge difference because those shuttles are 15 seaters, so they're not like the big buses, and they're able to do much more um, niche routes um, and provide you know more services that way too. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, thanks, Ross. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to Pierre now. Um, sorry for that. Um, you just uh, or Ross just uh, just mentioned the Easy Mile small buses, the autonomous shuttles, the so-called people mover. People mover. Um, they have like they're used in on campuses. They're used like in small confined areas at the moment. Um, but can you see them also rolling out like into the suburbs? And can you see also like if you want to step it up, can you see like a normal sized bus driving fully autonomous in cities? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, you're right. We see more and more, um, you know, people mover or, or shuttles uh, application uh, running in campus or airport, and 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 as, and as mentioned, there is a particularity here. It's a closed loop, it's a controlled environment, and and there is also a possibility to upgrade uh, the infrastructure because it is supported by a business case. So the we can amortize the cost of the technology and operation, even if today a lot of these applications are still in, in pilot phase, right? Um, but for fully autonomous buses in cities, I don't think it's going to be, you know, anytime soon yet. Uh, referring to the issue I, I explained earlier, earlier uh, you need a much higher AI to address um, the urban environment challenges. Like uh, the, the, the driving conditions in the cities are completely different from a quiet uh, university campus or uh, airport tarmac. Uh, therefore, the cost uh, of, of, of this technology compared to the current uh, city bus services does not enable a viable business model at this point. Um, however, for suburbs, remote areas where buses are today mostly empty, there could be a sustainable business case to improve transportation offering for underserved areas, but I would expect in this case that these are small autonomous bus or, or shuttles, right? And the thing is that with innovative mobility operators like RATP, Transdev, Keolis, and also promising technology providers like uh, Easy Mile, Navia, and, and Mila, France has a very good ecosystem to leverage and to really uh, deploy that kind of technology to to increase this multimodal offering. Thanks, Pierre. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm just my next column in Business Insider Gunnarsson is about like these little shuttles and and where they're driving around and there is a lot of uh, going on uh, with these shuttles. But I think we are still at the beginning with these shuttles, these people movers, and especially in the in the uh, when they're fully autonomous. I think. We also need to think about what are we or what can we do with bus transport now, uh, especially in big cities. And Cyprian, big cities, I like I, I, in Germany, every city has its own solution. I think it's the same in France. Um, so it seems to be that there are no magical solution how you can enhance your bus transport system, or do you have one? Of course, I I'll always have my magical wand and I can uh, put it in public agencies and so it works better and you have twice as more drivers. And yes, there is nothing magical uh, in public transport, public operation. It's quite simple. If you want more reliable buses, you need better systems, more services and more drivers. And to help, uh, to help think on what we can do 
uh, to uh, to to do that to be better uh, in uh, bus uh, bus transportation. I put two ideas uh, that people can work on uh, that I think will help uh, have better buses. <laughs> Uh, first thing I'll, I'll tell is we need to favor transmission and communication. Uh, for example, um, it's very hard for a newly elected uh, public uh, representative to become an expert in transport in mobility within his five years of ele elected time. Um, I can speak for experience. I've been in, in the public transport market for six years <laughs> and I don't think I am already a huge expert on public operation. I maybe know a little about uh, how uh, operator works and how public private partnership works, but I still need uh, to improve a lot of systems, infrastructure, uh, other mobility services, autonomous and everything that is discussed today uh, as I'm only expert on a small part, which is bus operation. And so uh, if people are changing with election, with uh, the rhythm of public private uh, partnerships, you need better communication, better transmission. And this uh, can be made with uh, contractual change and also with uh, uh, obligation for systems uh, to uh, communicate bet better within themselves. For example, there is um, uh, an association which is IT for PT. Uh, in I, I think it's a French association. I don't know, but it's a uh, world. Uh, they are worldwide, worldwide representants, and it uh, it's working on bringing uh, how to say it, uh, bringing uh, values and bringing um, of making systems communicate better with each other by setting uh, rules uh, in public transport on how we have to communicate within other systems. Uh, and if you have systems like that, uh, you can much, well, with much easy, have a much easier time changing systems or operating with other systems. Uh, a second point on what uh, you can do to uh, enhance bus transport uh, and it's linked to the first point because if people um, transmit better, have better knowledge on how this works, uh, you have better time analysis for analysis on offers for tenders. Um, most of the time when you have tenders for bus operation, um, I've, I've seen it in France, but I think it's pretty much um, everywhere else. You have uh, a price score which is much higher than the rest and if you only looking at the price of course you have to uh, sever uh, some services some technologies some investment for the drivers for the people and uh, in the long run you will not enhance your public services and if people don't have the knowledge of for analysis uh, and offer on, techni on technology, on management, on operation, what they can do is analyze on the price. So you have to transmit the competence, you have to transmit the knowledge uh, on how to make the bus work better, and you have to um, you have to um, value this experience, this experience within the bus operator and the public agencies. Yeah, thank you, uh, Supreme. Yeah, it, it, interesting to to see or to hear how many things are changing at the moment, and how many things are you have to change your also your view and the way you saw or you see public transport uh, at the moment. Um, this also goes, of course, for car owners and Sandrine. Um, what I find interesting when I when I'm talking to experts also here in Berlin. Uh, they always say, yeah, it's hard to get people out of their cars into the public transport. And one thing Paris is doing is they are scrapping most of their open space parking slots for private cars. You know, the slots where you can park your car on the side of the street, they will be gone. 
but how is this going forward and what do you think what impact these changes will have will the parisians really will get rid of their car uh, yes, so uh, the, the the team uh, uh, ruling the, the Mary of Paris uh, has a, a plan uh, to cut by half the, the uh, 150,000 uh, parking slots uh, outside uh, on open space in Paris. So uh, it's running and uh, it's good for Parisian people because for them uh, it's quite easy. Uh, you have to know that in Paris, in the city, the, the hot city of Paris, uh, uh, less than uh, half uh, family has a car. So uh, they don't use cars mainly. Uh, as I said before, the main issue is for people who live outside of the heart and they need to go to Paris for, the, for, for, for jobs and, and for life. And there is uh, still a week uh, offer for them. And uh, I, I, I repeat it, but it is true. And it's true that uh, people who are uh, commuting from uh, um, a public transportation to uh, active mobilities, uh, most often they are in the heart of the city and they, it's, again, it's easy for them because they are commuting for uh, small travels, less than uh, three kilometers or five kilometers. Uh, it's easy to make by bicycle, it's easy to make uh, by scooter or so, or so and so. But for people who have to, to run uh, uh, 20, 15 kilometers, uh, in the public, in the city area, it's uh, still hard and uh, they need um, a shift offer uh, to let, to, 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 to get rid of their car, of their own car, but to be sure that uh, the offer will be reliable and they, that they will be on time uh, at their uh, appointment, uh, rendezvous appointments or, or jobs because uh, it cannot be uh, a policy just for people who live in the center of the, of the city. That's uh, uh, still a big issue. And it is uh, also um, uh, discussed uh, between the mayor of Paris, which is uh, with uh, Anne Hidalgo, and uh, the president of the region, uh, Valérie Pécresse. And you have to know that they are both uh, running for a uh, presidential election uh, in France. So it's uh, the, the, this question of uh, public transportation is also a, a large uh, social question uh, uh, in France No. Yeah, because uh, I, 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 we have the same problem here in Berlin because uh, Due to gentrification of the last 10, 15 years, a lot of people with less money moved out of the city, but now they have to use a car to connect to their to their workplaces. So this is this is something that is going on, I think, in a lot of cities around the world. And it's going to be interesting to see how Paris will going to find the solution in that. But uh, having less cars in the city is one thing, Ross. Um, you need a car sometimes. I mean, I have the same problem sometimes. I have to transport things or I want to go to a place where it's hard to get uh, without a car. Um, so how can a family, let's say, with two kids can be fully uh, mobile, but without a car? Uh, and what kind of answers has France and Paris found for these questions? Yeah, I mean, good question. And obviously what Sandrine is saying is completely correct. It's, it's quite easy to live without a car if you live within the periphery of Paris, but only two and a half million people live there. Um, for those living in the suburbs, um, there's not, you know, you suddenly your geographical area expands exponentially. So it's very hard to put in the public transport as you get further and further away from the center of the city. Um, so, you know, car ownership is still a very good solution for people living in suburbs, and you have to realize that. Um, and it's very hard to make people living in suburbs car free. Um, car ownership works, um, and it's still, you know, the best thing to do there, obviously, is to go, go electric and sort of right size vehicles. But one of the problems that came with car ownership was that um, consumers kept buying bigger and bigger cars and more and more SUVs. 
So the single biggest increase um, of carbon emissions of late has been the switch from normal size vehicles to SUVs. So there's been this massive sort of scaling up on, on, on the types of vehicles that we drive. Um, in America, the biggest selling cars are Ford F F-150, which is obviously a huge big gas guzzler. So to answer your question, there are no real easy answers to get people away from car ownership if they don't live centrally in cities. Obviously, people are urbanizing. Obviously, the big trend is that we are now half the world's population live in cities. So, you know, a city like Paris is a, is a 15 minute city, but you can't replicate that in spread out suburbs. And that's why for in America, for example, um, with its urban sprawl, it's so difficult for Americans to get away from car ownership. So what you have to try and do is, is have a combination of light electric vehicles, which are incredibly efficient. Um, I use a, an electric cargo bike to move my two, two small children in Paris. Um, and you, I can do a lot of trips with an electric cargo bike that before I would have used um, a vehicle for. Um, I, can, I have a, a payload of you know 60 kilograms on an electric cargo bike. So I think what you want to have is a, is a diversity of, of vehicles that, so that you don't get consumers buying a big type of vehicle that they use for holidays and weekends and they use that to drive every route. Um, and that's the nice thing about electric vehicles compared to combustion is that you can make them in all different sorts of sizes and, and configurations. Um, the, other, the other thing is obviously is a, is a lot of shared models. So the ideal would be where consumers own a small electric vehicle for their day-to-day -day, um, commuting and needs which doesn't take up a lot of space, doesn't use a lot of energy. And when they want to go on holiday, they, they rent a, a bigger vehicle. Yeah, I heard the solutions also like from a lot of people like in, uh, I have a couple in Munich that, that also like rent a car sometimes if they want to go on a longer vacation or rest of the time they use public transport. They use all the means of the, transportation they have. There's also very good peer-to-peer -peer sharing as well. You know, So obviously, yeah. you know, if, if you have an apartment, you can rent it out on Airbnb. But if you have a motor car and it's underutilized, you, you can rent it out on, on one of the peer-to-peer -peer sharing platforms too. Um, and when you go to electric vehicles, what you need to do is increase the utilization of them because unlike combustion cars, uh, an EV will last 500,000 kilometers and more. And you are unable to drive that mileage um, within your use of the vehicle because consumers normally do about 14,000, 15,000 kilometers a year. So it would take you 40 years to, to, to get to kind of half a million kilometers. So that's not going to work. So you really will want to try and increase the usage of electric vehicles. And you can only do that through sharing platforms, whether they be peer-to-peer -peer or professional. I agree totally with you. Thanks a lot, Ross. Um, yeah, back to the autonomous cars and the buses. First of all, there was a, a question uh, if Paris already have test drives for autonomous vehicles. Um, and then is the next question is like, we need you talked about ai you talked about how important ai is for for uh, autonomous cars but there's also the digitalization of the infrastructure so how can we make our roads more digital so i'm going to answer first to the to the, the first question uh, regarding test drive in paris um, until now most of the test drive were you know shuttles in la defense or outside paris the latest um, actual autonomous vehicle test drive was um, announced last year in December. It's actually the company Mobileye, who is a Intel-owned company uh, that is working together with RATP and they are offering um, public to test autonomous vehicle uh, with an app, Movit, that they can use um, uh, from Galerie Lafayette. So that's let's say one of the first uh, test drive in Paris. And, and hopefully that will lead to a lot of additional testing because I explained before, uh, you need to test a, a lot your intelligence in the conditions of the city in order to fully deploy your, your system. Um, now, the second question regarding the infrastructure itself, uh, it's always a, a balance uh, linked to your business case. Um, as we discuss, uh, it could make sense to upgrade significant, significantly your infrastructure if you run on a dedicated route, right? If the shuttle is always on the same route, then yeah, it makes sense actually to put a little bit more intelligence on the infrastructure. But if you are, you know, driving and you aim to drive everywhere, uh, which is still another question, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense financially to upgrade the entire city of Paris, um, you know, especially if you have mixed traffic conditions. Um, the thing is that when you deport 
this intelligence in the infrastructure, for example, in traffic lights at the intersection, it, it becomes obviously easier to deploy the uh, autonomous vehicle technology because you will improve the vehicle perceptions. You will also have a much more precise, precise location of your vehicle and therefore the, 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 the barrier, the technological barrier on the vehicle is, is much lower. And then roads, of course, they are now becoming more and more digital with sensors such as intelligent cameras. Now we also are using LiDAR uh, on the road. Um, we see more and more intelligent traffic system that are deployed to improve traffic, road safety. And then we also um, see now V2X technology, so vehicle to you know X, which can be infrastructure, another vehicle, which uh, basically enable the possibility to send information from a vehicle to the infrastructure. So as an example, a smart intersection which has camera and LiDAR could detect a bike and a bus uh, having a collision, uh, but it's a blind spot for you for you as a driver or for an autonomous vehicle. But because the intersection detected that with V2X, they can send an alert to the connected vehicles in the surrounding to tell them that there is an incident at the intersection, right? So, of course, upgrading the infrastructure uh, will improve potentially the, tra the traffic, the road safety. But when you consider a robot taxi or a personal AV car, um, then, you know, you will try to mostly rely on your own vehicle if you want to drive outside a controlled environment. Um, and that's why I believe uh, we could envision fully um, AV neighborhood within some cities where you will have a, a dedicated infrastructure which will be adjusted accordingly but only autonomous vehicle will actually run and operate within this small neighborhood so that's that's a possibility thank you pierre um cyprian um there is in, in also like in your experience um with with public transport and bus transport of course um, they are perfect for transporting people, uh, but the technology that comes into buses are, I wouldn't say slow, but it's like slowly adapting in a way. How and we have this question also brought in uh, from our viewers, and like, how do you judge the benefit and costs of steering assistance um, systems in uh, supporting bus drivers um, when they're driving very close to like bus stops or something? So, how do you see the uh, steering assistance problematic in general. Yeah. Uh, so I answer the like two part of your question. Uh, one about the steering, which came from the the viewer, and the other one about technology and evolutions, uh, which was the first part of, uh, of what you said uh, about the steering assistance for driver. Uh, I, I think there there are benefits in. Uh, uh, giving assistance to driver and I accompany them uh, to simplify their days. But you need to uh, understand that the drivers have a lot to do uh, in their days being between driving, uh, uh, talking to the people to um, give them tickets, to giving them instructions, indications on what they have to do. And most of the time when they see uh, a new system, they have to use uh, they have to uh, deploy, uh, understand. They have to. Uh, uh, they have to be prepared for uh, this usage, and uh, it can be quite uh, complicated to uh, to add new uh, new systems and new uh, environments for the drivers without uh, com uh, without communication. You need to communicate a lot uh, to. Uh, to keep them uh, uh, in your side. And uh, the problem you can have uh, with uh, steering assistance is that there is still a lot of uh, people which aren't respecting uh, the bus stop. And if you are, uh, it can be a very great system, but if you have another vehicle which is parked just beside the bus stop, then your assistance uh, doesn't help because the bus driver has to stop and and at another place and another, another for, uh, from another angle and then well, just you just have to rely on the driver and so the driver still needs to learn how to uh, how to park correctly for uh, the PRM 
people uh, and you need you still need to rely a lot on the driver and this can help in some situation when you have uh, high services buses uh, and you know there are no car in your lane you know and the bus stop are pretty much all the same and you can aid the driver to go with assistance but with complex cities like paris with a lot of people with bikes with micro mobility people every pretty much everywhere a lot of pedestrian and people doesn't respecting respecting uh res doesn't respecting bus stop it can be quite difficult and you need the drivers and about technology <laughs> uh done uh what I say, uh, what is complicated and why uh, it, um, the technology evolution in public transport uh, has been s slower, I think that uh, what you can see in the private industry is, uh, I think one of the biggest issues uh, it has encountered is that they needed to be innovative before. Uh, you needed uh, 20 years ago to know when your bus will arrive you need to know uh, um, how many you have to have to respect your calendar, to respect your uh, uh, timesheet. And so we, um, the industrial had to develop systems before uh, 4G communication, before uh, wide internet access and rely on radio, rely on other technologies, which now are not as efficient, <laughs> sure. And uh, but these were huge investments for the public uh, company, for the public industries. And so they still need to make the balance between, OK, we have this old investment. Yes, they are not as much efficient as uh, new technologies can be. But uh, this investment has been made to last for 15 years. So what do I do? Do I just set everything in the trash can and just sit on all the investment I've made or do I try to develop on this whole technology and make it work better? And it can be pretty hard. Thank you, uh, Cyprian, for this uh, answer to this kind of more complicated, more in-depth uh, question with your very in-depth answer. Thanks a lot. Um, going back to mobility concepts, uh, there is I mean, if you have, if you want to implement new mobility concepts around the world, and no matter where you want to do it, it costs money, of course, because you have to change infrastructure, because you have to change or adapt to new uh, technologies. Um, there is like the thinking at the moment, especially when like cities don't have a lot of money, is like, is it change towards a sustainable public transport too expensive? Sandrine, you're an expert in that. And do you do you have any numbers like if cities actually save money when they make the change to uh, also a kind of new digital infrastructure and sustainable transport? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if they save money uh, with digitalization. Uh, what I'm sure is that uh, uh, pandemic crisis has uh, uh, accelerated dig digitalization, for example, by uh, e-ticketing. Uh, but um, what I know too, and as you said, that uh, cities and uh, public transport uh, authorities have lost a lot of money during the crisis. For example, uh, Ile de France Mobility has lost 2.6 billion in uh, 2020 and one more billion in 2021. So it's hard now to invest and uh, digitalization has a cost. Uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, digitalization can just replace um, the classic uh, public transport offer because uh, we need uh, local trains, we need uh, bus routes. And of course, you can uh, provide um, on demand transport for um, um, precise areas, but it's uh, for, for example, for last mile or uh, during the, the night or uh, not uh, um, the, the, the bigger shift uh, of, uh, um, of times, but uh, it, it 
it cannot be the only solution. So uh, public transport will continue to cost a lot and it's uh, it's it's a, a, a real a real issue nowadays uh, in France or and uh, in other countries also to uh, uh, adapt the business model. Yeah, I can I can totally understand that. And it's like I, I see that also like in other cities. I see that also like if you look outside of Europe, if you if you like looking into African countries or South American countries, that there is this this kind of discussion at the moment where to save money on one hand and where also to spend money. And there are some great examples from Africa where they decided to spend on infrastructure, new infrastructure instead of building new roads like in uh, Dar es Salaam, for example, which is uh, which is one thing. But talking about spending money, um, founding a startup is always a bit of an expensive thing, but it also can be very beneficiary for yourself. Um, Startups are also the main driver of the future of mobility or the changes in the future of mobility. Um, Ross, if I would start a new startup now in the sector, in the future of mobility, um, what would be your advice? Where should I start or concentrate my new business on? So, I mean, there's been a huge amount of money invested in the mobility space in the last 10 years. Um, the majority going into autonomous vehicle technology and um, here gave a figure of 200 billion that I think comes from a McKinsey report. Um, and then the other big amount of money going into digitalization because all vehicles will be connected. And now again, a huge amount of investment going into the electrification of motorcars. Volkswagen alone is going to spend 100 billion on um, you know, getting all of their uh, fleet of vehicles from combustion to electric. Um, you know, we, we have uh, um, you know, 200 exhibitors at our event, which is taking place on um, March 16, 17, the Port of Versailles. And what we see is that there are a lot of mobility operators in the business of moving people through scooter share, through bike share, through moped share, through car share. Um, you know, th those companies are starting to do well now. There were a lot of startups and now there's a lot of consolidation. Um, and if they win tenders in big cities like Paris or London, they have enough critical mass. And as more and more people move away from car ownership, they get more and more and more rides. Um, I think the, the, the big trends and the big opportunity is trying to aggregate services onto one pat platform and one payment gateway because people don't like jumping between apps to figure out how to move from A to B. So, you know, what we're seeing now is a lot of movement into what they call mobility as a service and how I, as a, as a commuter, can have one app that, you know, allows me to take an RGTP ride, um, and an Uber and a bike share and whatever else and, and, and joins those rides together to give me one multimodal trip with one payment um, that is optimized. Um, and that's incredibly complicated. So you need you know, clever people like Pierre who understand data, how to you know, choose and, 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 and you know, make a journey out of a number of different trips. So I think that is going to be a, a big opportunity. Obviously, autonomous vehicles is going to be a big opportunity too, but you know, hugely competitive space with you know the the likes of investment people like Waymo do. Um, and then I think you know a, a very underrated place is actually making new types of bicycles. Um, Van Moof is a, is a Dutch startup. It raised 167 million dollars. Um, it's an extraordinary amount for a, a bicycle startup. Whoever would have thought that a bicycle startup can raise 167 million dollars? So there's actually a lot of money in good quality hardware, and we're seeing now a big onshoring of bike manufacturing in Europe. Um, European bicycle manufacturers do about 22 billion euros a year. Um, it's a big business now, um, and often people, you know, in startups underestimate the value of building good quality hardware. So I think there's 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 opportunity all along the value chain, um, whether it be in electrification, but that's sort of for the big guys autonomous vehicle again for the, for the big guys but a lot of value in making quality vehicles that people in cities want and will buy i totally agree thank you ross um this is like interesting to see how the startup market is has developed also in the last two years we all expected that for example e-scooter companies will have like huge problems because they have not they're, they're losing customers and losing money but instead they raised a lot of money because you see the prospects of what's going on and talking about prospects pierre um 
we had one question from uh, that was here in, in, in my chat uh, saying that it's hard for um, these tourist coaches, the buses uh, that are traveling long distance because if you're not allowed to go into a city because we have a diesel engine in the back of your car um, or in the back of your bus, uh, how can you join? Because there are no electric buses at the moment on the market. This is one question. The other thing is, um, can autonomous buses change the whole holiday uh, industry so for example if we envision fully autonomous buses uh, going on on long trips will it be easier or cheaper you're muted sorry <laughs> sorry about that uh, I guess both questions are kind of like linked um, because at the end of the day, um, the, the business case for long haul uh, traveling is um, is linked to the um, to the fact that you can combine that with a first and last mile uh, final uh, let's say journey. So we call that like the hub to hub. And today, one of the booming uh, autonomous driving application is autonomous tr autonomous trucks or freight. Um, you can now start to see driverless trucks which are on the roads uh, in the US, especially in Texas at the moment or in China. And at the end of the day, it makes a very compelling business case, especially when you have a long distance to drive the logistic cost down. Um, but here in this case, we are dealing with transportation of goods, not people. So the liability issues are much easier to deal with. So the business model could be viable to you know, bring um, people from a hub to, um, you know, holiday vacation and then have the last first mile, which also could overcome some of the issues regarding the electrification. Um, the question is, what would be the confidence level in the public opinion? And where are we now with that? Would you let your children go to school holidays without any driver behind the steering wheel? Um, and, and that's why I think there is a big effort to make on you know, public acceptance about these technologies, which are um, eventually safer. And that's why we need to become more and more transparent on the data performance of autonomous vehicle. And that's another benefit of our smart data management platform. Um, we don't only help companies that are developing the technology, but we can also act as a trustful partner to share data on performance about autonomous vehicle. And at the, at the, at the moment, we have a very interesting discussion with public authorities, for example, uh, with the DPT uh, Damien Pichot, who ordered the, the report on autonomous driving deployment for uh, at European scale, in order to show how autonomous vehicle can really bring uh, safety on the road uh, to, to the public. Thanks a lot. Um, Cyprian, it's... How can I frame it? Um, oh, let let me let me put it together. Like we talked a lot about costs, we talked a lot about uh, other things in this round. Um, and public transport providers have to invest heavily into new technology, especially in digital technologies. Um, how can these investment pay off quickly? And can you help them with this question? I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Uh, yes. Now, That's now you're that, good. That should be good. Yes. Uh, yes, of course, it's. I, I know every business is about rentability. I think public transport is more about services than rentability, but it still is a question, and it's good that it's a question because you don't want taxes uh, to go uh, just in um, uh, without, without putting much stuff in your process, in your investment process. One of the most common example I have uh, when uh, when I start working with a new operator, uh, when you with a new customer, is uh, that the the image of uh, a company can change if you made if you make investments in new technologies, in new services, in better communication with your drivers, with your manager, and most of the time it has side effect, uh, but. Uh, a huge side effect, I'd say, uh, that it can reduce turnover. And in uh, in a market uh, when you're struggling every day to recruit, to train, to uh, keep 
your driver to keep your people uh, because the image is seen as not as good as uh, anywhere else. It's always a good side effect to have people stay a little more in your company and even um, three, four or five percent less turnover can be a very huge uh, beneficial side effect. And it's just the side effect of investing in new technologies because you still have other uh, benefits with better usage of your resource, be it human or uh, hardware vehicles. You have less fuel consumption with uh, eco-conduit, uh, eco-driving uh, or other uh, effect with your drivers directly. You have time gain. You have much, much, much less paper uh, used. Uh, and everything put together with direct effect and side effect can add very substantial gain and benefits for the company. Thank you. That was, uh, I think, uh, a, something that a lot of people who are, have to invest, a lot of companies that have to invest now in, in new technology want to hear that it's actually beneficial uh, in the end. Before, and we also come to the end uh, at the moment, we have a couple of minutes left and I will try to use this uh, and I ask you for a short answer, which is always, I know, a bit complicated or not so easy with uh, what I want to ask you now, because I want to ask you now about your prospect, about your outlooks that you have for 2030. So, Sandrine, what has changed until 2030 and where do you see the mobility and the traffic in uh, Paris in 2030? Yes, uh, before 2030, I would uh, like to say that uh, we will have uh, Olympic Games in uh, 2024 and it will be a good test because there are a lot of projects of uh, new transport offers. Uh, of course, uh, autonomous uh, uh, shuttles, um, uh, robot taxis and so and so. Uh, but there will be also uh, needed a lot of uh, special uh, bus routes uh, in order to um, transport the, the, the Olympic delegations. And uh, it will be also uh, very interesting to see how we'll uh, uh, run the Paralympic Games because this is also a special uh, uh, transport offer for uh, disabled people uh, and that will be also uh, um, important to see how we will manage to transport everybody in good condition and uh, with a, a reliable, reliable, sorry, reliable offer. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to, to say. I also saw a question in the, in the list uh, upon uh, the, the cut by 50% uh, of the parking slots in Paris. Uh, the, the goal is 2026 and it's uh, in the city um, climate plan. So. Thank you, Sandrine, so much. Uh, yeah, as you said, like the Olympic Games in 2024 will be a really nice test for, for Paris, as it was just for Tokyo, where they also yeah, used autonomous cars from, from Toyota, for example, which worked very well, as I heard. Ross, what are your prospects for 2020, 2030? What do you think, uh, uh, what, what are the, the means or the modes of transportation that's going to be used the most? So, Don, I mean, by the time we get to 2030, the big trends will be obviously everything electric. Um, you will see a huge diversity of vehicles, a whole lot of new brands you've never heard before. The Chinese have about 30 um, fairly serious electric car companies, and they're starting to launch into Europe this year and next year. So we'll see brands we've never heard of before coming out of um, Southeast Asia. Um, there's a very good brand, for example, coming out of Vietnam. So a, a whole lot of new players in, in, in the industry, um, you know, new car brands. Um, um, logistics is going to be a huge issue because there's more and more online shopping. So we'll see electric drone delivery, we'll see cargo bike delivery, we'll see autonomous robot um, delivery, and um, that's going to be a big thing. Um, the, the, the only thing that I'm unsure of in 2030 is will we have you know, sort of flying taxis? Um, there has been quite a few specs uh, with companies like Lilium um, that offer a flying um, drone effectively for, for you know, commuting. 
Um, for me, that is the only thing I'm, I'm not sure if we will see in 2030, but for the rest, autonomous vehicles, autonomous shuttles, all electric, um, we'll see that. And for me, the biggest trend we'll see is that there'll be a massive reduction in car ownership. There'll be very little reason to own your own car because it'll be much cheaper, much more interesting, much more fun to use, use all these different modes, which you'll be able to do just by tapping your, your smartphone. Thanks a lot, Ross, and thanks a lot for your participation, of course. Pierre, uh, what do you think? Uh, what's going on with autonomous uh, vehicles? Will we all be sitting in little autonomous hubs that are um, maneuvering around the cities? Uh, well, it's it, as you probably understood from from my uh, let's say uh, insight. It's it's difficult to say. It's difficult to predict. Um, what well, we can say that, and everybody will agree that the future mobility is electric, uh, connected, autonomous, and shared. I'm not going to repeat what uh, my colleagues here said about electrification or car ownership. Um, so I'm just going to make a specific comment regarding autonomous driving. There are definitely benefits in, in this technology for a safer, a more affordable and a greener mobility. Uh, the thing is that US and China are far ahead of Europe uh, because we have a huge deficit in these technology investments. So I, I, for me, my you know, takeaway or let's say my, my, my word here is really more about the political decisions that are at stake for Europe. Are we going to step up or let these companies take over the entire mobility business? Because if we don't wake up, um, we will let companies like Tesla, Google, Amazon pre be the pre predominant uh, industry players. Thank you. And uh, Pierre, I, I totally agree with that when I see like the numbers of investment, that are especially going on in China. I was like, oh, OK, um, but not uh, ending with these bleak <laughs> view on autonomous driving. Sure about that. Um, uh, Cyprien, uh, do you have a positive outlook for us for 2030? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short and I, I don't know if it's more of, I think it's more of a wish than a vision for uh, for the future, but uh, I, I wish that uh, the public transport industry overall image uh, will be better, uh, better so that we can have more talented people uh, which uh, come to help um, have a better overall transport. Uh, I'd like to see some discussion like, oh, your bus driver seems great. Uh, thank you, your public transport agent. Yes, it's very good. Thank you for your services. It's, and, and I think um, it's already started. Uh, that's why I'm positive about it, because uh, I heard people uh, have a vision, more positive vision on public transport because of the ecological issues known as, known as climate change, uh, but um, to be more positive, people are seeing the public transport as a solution and so the image is going better and I hope it, it just continue along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Of, uh, thank all of you, Sandrine, Ross, uh, Pierre and uh, Cyprian for all your answers that you uh, gave us today and the, the really very interesting insight that we had into the future of mobility and what's going to happen there. Uh, I want to thank you again. I want to thank my the viewers, of course, but we're not finished yet. Um, uh, we have some more little interesting things coming up. And for that, I will uh, hand over the virtual microphone to Pascal. Thank you, Don. Um, so our bus to bus roadshow comes to an end now. A big thank you to all participants. Um, we hope we could give you some impulse and some ideas for your own business. If you have further questions um, to our speakers, do not hesitate to get in touch with us via our website or um, to find us on LinkedIn. We will be happy to connect you with our today's guest. So thank you for being with us again. We'll leave you with a short film and impression of Bus to Bus 2019. And we invite you all to save the dates for the next bus to bus trade show that will take place in Berlin from 27 to 28th of April 2022. Goodbye and see you soon in Berlin. <laughs>